Hello. First tonight, the county council accused of wasting millions of pounds of public money at a time when budgets couldn't be tighter. Financial expert Michael Gower was brought in by Suffolk County Council to manage a big contract with BT. Fewer than two years later, he resigned, saying he felt rising costs were out of control. The council, for its part, insists the contract has led to better value and better services. I've decided with immediate effect to resign from my post as Head of Supplier Relationship Management at Suffolk County Council. A resignation letter Michael Gower never wanted to write, but he says his attempt to manage a massive contract with BT to improve council services was ignored by those at the top. I felt we weren't getting value for money. I, think we were, I, th I felt we were letting down the council taxpayers. I felt that um, we weren't being professional. Six years ago, Suffolk County and a local district council partnered up with British Telecom to form a joint venture company called Customer Services Direct, or CSD. It would provide a call centre and web service for people to access council services, an overhaul of the council's internet and communications and human resources, and a new internal finance system. BT would plough £52 million into the venture. The county council agreed over 10 years to pay BT £323 million for the CSD contract. But that has already jumped to £417 million. Now, the council didn't want to put anyone up for interview, but it points out that the extra £94 million it spent is partly down to inflation. It says that the CSD contract has developed services, which in turn has increased its value. It also points out that the project wasn't specifically set up simply to save money. Well, that's absolutely rubbish because I can remember all of the hoopla at the time and the council saying this is a wonderful £300 million contract that's going to save us £60 million. So there's, there's the leaving card. Even Michael Gower won. says that BT has done nothing wrong. They were being extremely commercial and the council was probably rather naive. So you're saying that the contract wasn't properly sewn up at the outset? Correct. And what did that lead to? That led to us paying for a lot of services, or some services, which should have been included in the original contract. It led to ambiguity over what was in the contract and what was out of the contract. Last year, this woman, the council's chief executive, Andrea Hill, attended two week-long courses run by BT. They were based in San Francisco and Boston. Her costs were not funded by the council. That, says Michael Gower, could create the wrong impression. Well, come on, there is no such thing as a free lunch. If you're taken to the United States on a training course, there is, there's bound to be some sort of expectation that there will be some return on this. The council says BT's training programme is attended by chief executives across the public sector. Both courses were fully approved by the monitoring officer and the council leader. While Michael Gower takes time out, Suffolk County Council maintains the contract is on course to deliver both savings and efficiencies. Alex Dunlop, BBC Look East. The latest jobless figures were released today, and while unemployment has risen nationally, here it's gone down. It now stands at 202,000, a fall of 2,000 on the previous quarter. 6.7% of the workforce are unemployed, compared with 7.9% nationally. Unemployment is still high, though, with lots of people chasing vacancies. Employers still say there's a real shortage of skilled staff. This report is from our business correspondent, Richard Bond. The bad weather means it's been a busy time lately for the window repair firm Autoglass. Its technicians are backed up by 600 people at the company's headquarters in Bedford. Oh, I am sorry to hear that. Did they steal anything from the vehicle? Last month, Autoglass advertised for 10 call centre agents and got 430 applications, but only 24 of them had the right skills. I think that really shows that it's a very tough environment out there. There's a lot of people that are looking for work. Perhaps people are applying for absolutely everything that they can, um, even though it may not be entirely suitable for them and they might not be experienced for. Fancy a job paying 50 grand a year? Well, they're on offer here at Validus. It's a technology firm in Norwich serving the insurance industry. It's taken on 120 people in three years. Another 100 will be needed in the coming year. Software engineers like these and claims staff too. But it can't find people with the right skills. The standard of engineers coming out of university isn't high enough 
and the standard of people coming out uh, in this area from the colleges also isn't quite up to the standard that we need. We have a very successful partnership with the Financial Skills Academy to help close that gap, but it is a challenge for us. This region has particular skills shortages in IT, engineering and finance. Part of it is, is through raising awareness amongst young people at school in terms of where the careers of the future actually are. There's a responsibility uh, for government, but there's also, I think, a, a responsibility for local employers and local recruiters to form part of that debate and to work constructively with schools on a local level. If the problem's not sorted out, it will slow the recovery. Richard Bond, BBC Look East. Back now to a story we reported on last week, the rising cost of heating oil. The oil companies said the price hikes were down to simple supply and demand. Well, dozens of you said it was blatant profiteering. Janine Machin has been looking at your calls, and she's at a pub in Barton near Cambridge now. Janine. I certainly am. In fact, prices certainly haven't fallen since that last report of ours. I'm at the White Horse in the Cambridgeshire village of Barton, which is where people rely on oil-fired heating because, quite simply, there is no gas here. Now, they're also one of the places where they formed an oil-buying consortium in the hope that joining together to buy in bulk might help them get a better deal throughout the rest of the year. But it does seem that whoever and wherever you are, if you need oil right now, it won't come cheap. Wiccan near Ely is another village which relies on oil. And right now, Rod Fox has never been more relieved to have a coal fire as a backup. You know, if you rely on the heating, you either pay the ex extra price, which is extortionate, or you freeze. Rod's seen a 68% increase in the cost of his heating oil since September. He says it's terrifying for the pensioners on low incomes and greatly unfair for everyone else. If the cost of petrol went up the same amount as the heating oil has gone up in three months, we'd be looking at nearly £1.93 a litre, which is just, you know, there'd be riots at the pumps, you know, people would be out with placards. We're now being told we can't get any until the new year. We've got people coming for Christmas. We don't really want to be sort of chopping up the furniture to put on the fire, you know. Well, lots of people have contacted BBC Look East, sharing their concerns about the cost of fuels, many of them wanting to know exactly who's making the money here. We've heard from Alan Rogers, who's in Suffolk, and he says the rising price of oil is one thing, but what's made him really angry is that he's been told he could have to pay an extra £100 just to get a prompt delivery. Colin tells us that he used to work as a tanker driver, actually delivering household oil. He says the guide price was set at head office, but then the local office would charge whatever they thought they could get away with. Richard Green, Kevin Fremantle, just a couple of those people who are crying out for more regulation of this particular industry. And it does seem as though it's not just the cost of oil which is on the up. We've heard from lots of people who rely on propane gas, on LPG, even firewood. They're all telling us that prices are are going up. Many of them have asked their MPs for help. Well, the government has told us that an open market actually provides the best long-term guarantee of competitive prices for the consumer. As such, they say they cannot control heating oil prices. But the government has added that it's relaxed the laws on drivers' hours temporarily to help suppliers make up those backlogs and meet seasonal customer demand. So what exactly is the advice? Well, Jeremy Cole is from Agricol. He's a, an oil broker. Um, Jeremy, is there any good news? What can people do if they need oil? Um, I think in the short term, very little. If you're going to run out before Christmas, I think it's very difficult indeed to get any oil. I think you'll just have to turn the radiators down and probably put a jumper on. It really is that bad. Um, what's caused this? Everyone's blaming each other. Um, well, it's the cold weather. A massive demand. A lot of people just topping up their oil tanks, which actually is exacerbating the problem and just leading to a lack of vehicles for people to have a delivery from. And I did say that you're an oil broker. You try and get the best price, but even you can't get any now. I oh, know. None of my suppliers will guarantee me a delivery before Christmas. They may get a delivery, but they're not guaranteeing it. Well, people have literally been in tears on the phone, haven't they? It's that bad. Yeah, I had a lady ring me up and she'd run out of oil because someone had stolen it. And I don't know what to do. Well, we are told that some suppliers and very few will allow you to take a can and, and fill up a, a small can for yourselves. But people are getting through 15, 20 litres a day in these temperatures. It certainly isn't good. And whether you're on oil, LPG or gas, it seems things won't improve this side of Christmas. Janine, thank you.